People often think of linguistics as something that you do sitting in your office thinking deep thoughts. So basically it's an armchair theoretical mm, investigation which is done by a lonely linguist. And the image is that of a lonely linguist or lonely philosopher or lonely philologist. They all kind of look alike. And this is how linguistics used to be until very, very recently, where the thought process was roughly this. Um, you'd think about some phenomenon in language. You would ask yourself, can you say X? Can you say Y? You would then go and ask a couple of your friends. And based on what everybody said, you would compare a couple of forms and decide which one of them is better than the other. But as the low-hanging fruit has been collected, we've started seeing that there are a lot of phenomena in language which are subject to tremendous variation. And it's not enough to think your own deep thoughts or ask a friend or a couple of friends because people will have very different judgments. In a lot of linguistic theorizing based on English syntax, um, there is this assumption that you can never ask a question of a part of a subject. So for example, what did the book about sell well? And indeed, this is not a good sentence of English. But if you start looking at something like, what did a bottle of break? That's not such a bad sentence of English. It turns out that although the assumption is that you shouldn't be asking questions out of subjects, some questions out of subjects are better than others. So that led to the observation that there are a bunch of phenomena in language which may have some kind of graded effects and which are subject to gradable judgments. Another observation that people have made was that linguists often have judgments which are very different from the rest of the people. There was a study where um, a researcher in England took a lot of sentences which are used in linguistic textbooks and asked a bunch of janitors, a bunch of undergrads, and then a bunch of academics in the UK whether they like those sentences or not. It turned out that the academics were okay, but the janitors and the undergrads completely rejected a lot of the material which used to be um, bread and butter of theoretical linguistics. So all those observations led to the conclusion that we need to get outside of our studies and stop thinking deep thoughts and asking our friends, but try to establish more experimentally based investigations where the data would come from large groups of speakers. So that led to the development of what's now called behavioral approaches to linguistics, where we will conduct large-scale surveys asking many, many people what they think of a particular question or a particular set of sentences or a particular sound. It's now extremely easy to do because there are a bunch of online sites which allow us to do that. For example, there is this wonderful site called the Amazon Mechanical Turk. So if you think about Mechanical Turk, it was, that was a precursor to the human robots of our days. The Mechanical Turks were inv invented in the 17th century by um, German researchers, and now they have this website where you can put any kind of experiment, be it exp in linguistic or non, and ask people um, to judge your data. And in 24 hours, you'll get massive data on a bunch of um, various things. So just recently we did a big study um, looking at the resumption in English where we're asking people whether it's okay to say something like um, this is the person that when the police arrested him everybody was happy. Textbooks on English say that's bad. Everybody speaks like that. So the question is if, is it really good or bad? And so Mechanical Turk is just one of the examples which allows you to get a lot of data. So now um, You've totally changed the landscape of how you determine the material that you work on. So you've got massive data, and you can certainly apply various statistical models which will allow you to work on that. But the question then is how to feed this back into the theory, because it's not enough to just get massive data and to say, okay, well, my data are much cleaner than the data which were established in 1968 when there was no mechanical term. The big question is whether or not we can ask questions in such a way that the answer will establish um, the, uh, will change the foundations of our linguistic theory. So let me give you a couple of examples. One has to do with the formation of what's called relative clauses. A relative clause is a clause of the type, this, um, this is the person who left yesterday, who left yesterday is a relative clause. In 
quite a few languages, uh, you can never uh, make a relative clause out of the subject of the transitive. So you can say, this is the person who left, but you cannot say, this is the person who wrote this book. And so the question is, why? One of the hypotheses is that this has something to do with the difficulty that the real-time processing of such sentences imposes on human parser. And so obviously, in order to test this hypothesis, we need to look at the languages which allow you to form relative clauses, like this is the man who wrote the book, and then compare this is the man who wrote to book, the book to this is the man who left, and compare them together to this is the book that the man wrote. And if we do find that this is the man who wrote the book is really more difficult than the others, we can then hypothesize that the languages that don't allow you to form those relative clauses are basically just taking this constraint to the extreme, turning what's called a soft constraint into a hard constraint. And so this is an example where linguistic theorizing could actually benefit from processing study. To make a long story short, we've run some studies like that, and we've discovered that there is no penalty for saying this is the man who wrote the book. That means that those languages which don't allow such relative clauses, don't allow them for reasons which are other than processing. So now you're sending your uh, linguist back to his study where he's going to sit and think deep thoughts and stroke his beard and try to come up with a purely theoretical solution because the processing explanation has not worked. On the other hand, there are some explanations which actually take us away from structure. And um, to illustrate that, let me go back to this case of resumption, which I pres presented earlier. And that is, this is the man that when the police arrested him, everyone was happy. So every English grammar book says that's bad. People say that a lot. And there have been quite a few linguistic theories which are very, very complicated. But basically, they um, indicate that this resumptive pronoun, him, in this is the man that when the police arrested him, this resumptive pronoun is there because it's needed to show that something has been taken out of its initial position and put into a different position. So in a way, what people say is very deeply tied to their uh, grammatical representation. So in order to test that, you need to see if people in a large scale do accept resumptive pronouns. And if they accept them, let's say, better in the object position than in the subject position and so on. So again, to make a long story short, we've done a study like that. And we have found that there is absolutely no improvement for listeners when they hear a resumptive pronoun, which means that the theoretical foundation on which the theory of resumption in English has been built is completely wrong. Um, that means we need to think what happens. And so it turns out that people like resumptive pronouns when they speak, and they like them in particular when they make a pause. So something like this, the man who, pause, when the police arrested him, and then you keep going. So this means that resumptive pronouns are not really a phenomenon of grammar, but more, more or less um, a strategy that selfish speakers use when they start speaking and they realize that they've kind of painted themselves into the corner, but they don't want to revise the whole thing. So if that's the case, then we need to put them into the, uh, s into the box of our strategies for continuing my own thought, instead of putting it into some very complicated syntactic box where it used to be. And so this is just another illustration where um, linguistic theory has benefited from um, using more experimental methods. And until we had done that, people would be just thinking, oh, you know, I can say that or I cannot say that. Lately, there's been a lot of really interesting work where people have looked at um, massive behavioral data, looking at how people judge certain sentences, how long it takes them to answer a certain question, because reaction time is also very important. And obviously, the question is, where do we go next? And I would like to identify two areas where we can go next. The first frontier that we want <clears throat> to get to next is uh, figuring out 
how language is processed in the brain. And this is where experimental approaches to language have to be very important. Every language has relative clauses, so it's been extremely important for experimental work. And this is the area where people have started looking at linguistic representation in the brain. So you give a speaker of Japanese or a speaker of Russian or a speaker of Spanish two sentences. One is, this is the man who wrote the book, and the other is, this is the book that the man wrote, and see whether or not their brain responses are different. So the question is twofold. First, whether or not the person will respond um, to the two relative clauses in a different way. And second, whether a speaker of English and a speaker of Japanese would respond differently. And the initial results indicate that there is not much difference between speakers of Japanese and speakers of English in terms of how they process those structures in the brain, which is a very important result because it tells us that whatever the cognitive underpinnings of language are, they trespass and surpass linguistic individual linguistic barriers. So that's the, the next frontier. And um, we have ways to go beyond relative clauses. We have lots and lots of things that we can study. So the second, um, the second uh, step that we, or the second area where we want to take our experimental approaches to language has to do with um, reformulating our theories and then asking particular theoretical questions concerning um, let's say a, a certain area of language. Um, let's say you speak a language which has genders. Um, Russian is such language or Spanish is such language. On the other hand, you have languages like English where there's no gender. Is there any difference between how people who speak a gendered language like Russian or Spanish keep their nouns in their head as opposed to speakers of English? On the surface, there doesn't seem to be any difference, but if we don't see any difference, then we don't really know why gender is needed. And so there is no way to answer this question without doing experimental work. And so this is another area or another illustration of how experimentation finds its way into linguistics and totally revamps the field. I think that in the years to come, we'll see a lot of really exciting developments there in um, both mapping language in the brain and answering more complicated theoretical questions based on experimental data.